You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings, I'm Alan Weitz, and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today, my producer, John Harris, and I will be talking about photography. Not the nuts and bolts type of photography we usually banter about, but rather the aesthetics and photographic sensibilities expressed in Ocean of Images, New Photography 2015, a photographic exhibition on display at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, through March 20th, 2016. Our guests today are Roxana Markoch, Senior Curator at MoMA's Department of Photography, and Stephen Mays, Executive Director of the Tim Hetherington Trust, former CEO of Seven Agency, and an accomplished writer and media strategist. Welcome, Roxana. Welcome, Stephen. We're going to begin the show by having Roxana give us a little bit of a background about Ocean of Images, and then we're going to come back to Stephen and get his take on the show. Roxana, can you give us a brief history of the new photography exhibit and who are some of the more notable artists who have been introduced to us over the years? Sure, with great pleasure. Uh, Well, new photography was launched in 1985 by John Tcharkovsky, who at the time was the director of the photography department. And one of John's idea was that we would uh, implement a very robust program uh, where we will have every year a small focused exhibition that will showcase the work of four to five emerging, I would say, photographers who had already built a solid body of work. Um, There weren't any such programs at the time, and the new photography series became truly a pioneering series insofar as it was at the very crux of the contemporary program at the Museum of Modern Art. Interestingly, that has happened since 85 to today on an annual basis. Now, this year we have celebrated the 30th anniversary of the series. So henceforth, we will be making some changes and the series will happen on a biannual basis. Uh, it will be larger. It, it has a much more uh, international roster of artists and it has a more curated uh, point of view, I would say. Um, a few years ago, I would say maybe 10, year, 10 years ago, yeah, uh, one of the New York art critics has noted um, that if we were to put together a shorthand history uh, of the new photography series, we would end up, in fact, with a history of contemporary photography. So we had shown photographers quite early in their career since 1985, about 100 international uh, photographers. Um, And I can happily give you uh, a handful of examples. For instance, the very first edition in 85 showed the work of Judith Joy Ross. Um, The second one um, in in 86 uh, introduced the work of Philip Lorca di Corsia, The third one, uh, both Paul Graham and uh, Thomas Roma were uh, featured in it. And uh, in New Photography 4, Michael Schmidt was presented in it and so on and so forth. Track record's good. The record is really good. I mean, not all of them became as known as others, but... um, But I would say that overall, it's a very impressive record of... um, Would you say that prior to this iteration, it was more of an American set of photographers? Yes. I mean, uh, the the very first ones, they were exclusively, uh, you know, American photographers. Was that intentional or just... I mean, I cannot really speak for my predecessors, really, but... (laughs) um, But I think that if you look uh, at how the series developed, it went from being mostly American, mostly black and white photography, mostly photography that was matted and framed on the wall, uh, to, to, to becoming... Uh, very international at some point, more women included, uh, artists from all over the globe. Um, I think it had to do also with with how photography... Well, when John when John really started this program, there wasn't any such program. 
th there was no other museum was doing a similar program. Now th th they have proliferated at all the major institutions. A lot of museums only... and galleries didn't even recognize photography as being an art form. Well, so that's what I... Well, at the time, you mean. Yeah, were. back then, yes, sure. Yes, yeah. for sure. Um I think that that was one of the missions of John Czarkowski to, to, to show how photography was an art form. And sometimes to the point where that sort of proclivity of his, of, of so much putting photography at the forefront as an art form could have and has been also criticized. What was interesting at one point was that in 1998, uh, New Photography 14, uh, which was curated by Darcy Alexander. For the very first time, artists working with the photographic medium uh, were presented in the series. Uh, and that kind of marked a shift uh, in, in the presentation of the work that both photographers and artists with the photographic medium, which at the time still was a very polarized field, maybe it still is today, um, they were they were presented in 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 this series. So we started much more of sort of integrating uh, those two. What fractions. sort of artwork was being incorporated? So I, I'm assuming so it sounds like instance, we went from photographs on the wall to other. Not medium. only that, but there were really um, there were really artists that were working across mediums, not exclusively in photography. Her that particular. Uh, edition included the work of John Dunning, Olafur Eliasson, Rachel Harrison, and Sam Taylor Wood, for instance. So, you know, Olafur Eliasson works in large-scale installations. He also has uh, a number of very impressive photographic series. And Rachel Harrison is primarily known as a sculptor, uh, and photography is sort of incorporated into her sculptural installations. Well, in, in the show that is currently showing, the mm -hmm. 30th ex ex exhibit, there mm -hmm. are a lot of alternatives mm -hmm. to straight prints. There's, there are straight prints on the wall, right. very conventional, but there's also other formats. How is Ocean of Images a departure from what we're calling the norm in terms of the past photo exhibits? And what were some of the criteria you used for selecting the artists? Well, I'll tell you, uh, first of all, the way that the... Oh, by the way, I want to say I don't envy you the job of having to make all of those decisions. It couldn't be easy. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I, I envy myself, but that's okay. <laughs> um, no, I think that it's actually a quite interesting process. And all, all the curators in the photography department, um, we meet, in fact... Um, usually about this time of the year. And we bring to the table everything that we have researched over the past year and sometimes over the previous year. And artists or photographers that we have followed sometimes for quite a few years. So we, we do PowerPoint presentations um, and usually we look at about, for every new photography series, over 100 photographers or artists working with a photographic medium. And then the process is refined. And in this case, we have 19 artists and artist collectives. In the past, there were anywhere from two artists to, I think, eight artists. Would you say that... In, in the case of this show, the theme of the show, or was the theme of the show established before you went to look for artists, or were you already kind of, you had ideas on who you wanted to include, and then the theme formed around that? No, we didn't make any imposition on us with regard to the theme. That would be almost illustrating a concept, and I, I, I don't think that we work that way. Um, we start from the work, really. We start from the artists that we like. So we bring them to the table and then uh, we try to see how they might work together and also what do they share. And sometimes it may be a very formal, stylistic. That's, that wasn't really the case here. No, not at all. Uh, no. It wasn't how similar they would be on a formal level, but what... On a more, what were the conceptual underpinnings that, that they shared? And... Um, and I should say that uh, the question that also that we were posing ourselves with this exhibition was not just 
generally very in a very generic way like what is photography in the 21st century but rather more critically what is contemporary photo based culture so when we when we started uh, asking that question we immediately came across issues of connectivity circulation of images networks of information and um, and communications models and we realized that in fact what unites this group of artists that we are interested in, and there were many others that we couldn't include, um, um, was was this idea of the post-internet, that they were all part of a post-internet generation. And wh what does that mean? It doesn't mean that they are all working with or on the internet, but rather that they are making images and their cultural production is made with an understanding, with a consciousness of the network or the system within an, which an image exists. Do you think there's any photographers or artists working today that don't work within that or f understand that system? seems to me that it's it's so pervasive for anyone working in the perhaps, media. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps yeah. it is pervasive now, uh, especially since, you know, the internet, even when we delink ourselves from the internet, it still persists as a mo mode of life and a mode of experiencing the world. Is there an aesthetic difference between pre-internet and what we're calling now post-internet as far as the images we're actually seeing on the walls being either hanging in frames or or being projected or being sculpted into with with wood or other materials into a 3d form is there actually a difference in the aesthetics between what was before we went online and what's now considered mm. online right well i think that uh <laughs> You tell me that. I mean, you you are the viewer, and you would know how this an exhibition like New Ocean of Images. It has a title, by the way. Previous editions didn't have a title. But how does it differ to other uh, photography exhibitions that you have seen? And I think that um, it is that kind of an exhibition that shows the porosity, in fact, of photography. That photography is very fluid. That it is in flux. Uh, and that it can take different shapes. In fact, you know, in this exhibition, you can experience it as a cut out uh, photographic sculpture, as uh, a, a projection, as a zine, as a takeaway poster, as something that exists only in the internet uh, or as a publicity campaign. How does that differ from, if you go back a couple of hundred years, a lot of painters and even sculptors used uh, camera obscures to basically project the basic image onto a canvas and paint it from that. Photography has been part of art before it, cameras per se came into being, before you can go out and buy a Kodak camera and take pictures. Photography, the concepts of photography, the, the image being projected onto a wall was used in artwork for a long time. Isn't that sort of is it, are we talking about the same thing? Is it just a continuation of using this ethereal image and capturing it either as a tracing or, or, or as a physical print or a projection? Is there any real difference between all of that? Well, that's a legitimate question. And I think to a certain degree, maybe we are in a pre-photographic moment. You know, I mean, the camera obscura and uh, there are very interesting artists working with the camera obscura. Uh, Zoe Leonard, for instance, mm -hmm. who creates uh, actual cameras obscuras. Uh, she builds room like environments where the photographic image, because it is a photographic image after all, is never pinned down. We, it's, it's, it's the anti-decisive moment, right? Uh, where uh, what you experience is only once. It's fluid. It's in flux. Um, it, it's perpetually developmental. It's not a print. It's not something that is an object. It's, it's a moving image of sorts. And I think that what's interesting about this, which brings us back to your question about this exhibition, is that this 24-7, you know, image traffic that we are experiencing today, in fact, is not sui generis. 
And if you think about it, uh, it goes back certainly at the beginning, not only of the medium, but it has different revivals. So I don't know if it's a continuation, but it might be a disruption of uh, what we know as being a photograph. What is the photographic as opposed to what is the photograph? So I think that uh, there are several moments within the history of this perpetually changing medium, uh, the photographic medium, uh, where we have experienced, not to the degree that we are today, of billions of images, but we have experienced similar situations. And that was in the 1920s with the advent of the, you know, lightweight 35 millimeter camera. It was a Leica first, but there were many others, perforated film with the uh, wide angle lens and, and the flash bulb, all of these elements, wide aperture, right, that allowed uh, photographers to uh, take pictures much more rapidly in m more quantities. And also, it's very interesting, but it created a very more dynamic mode of image production, which was linked to montage. And so... You have that in 1924 already, which leads to, for instance, such social theorists as Sigrid Krakauer to talk about the notion of a blizzard of images. So at that time, they were experiencing something similar to what we do today. And then in 1983, just a few years before the, um, before the launching of the World Wide Web, uh, the Brazilian Czech... Uh, Theorist Willem Flusser talks about two paradigmatic shifts in the history of mankind since its beginnings. One being uh, in the second half of the second millennium of the common era, the invention of linear writing. And the second one, uh, something that we are experiencing right now, is the birth of technical images, meaning photography, film, and the rest. So... With this change from, you know, the linearity of writing to uh, this much more dynamic mode of image production, I think that our own way of experiencing and understanding reality, the word, what the word is, how we experience it, has changed. And that is in function also of technological apparatuses such as the camera, the lens, the scanner, all the various means that uh, the artists in this exhibition uh, are using. Can we speak uh, about a few of the uh, of the photographers, of the artists who are included in the show? Maybe highlight something that you like, and of course, without giving names, maybe a piece that you considered but just didn't quite fit or didn't work. And and also maybe if there's one of the pieces that uh, that is an outlier from the rest of the group. I cannot give you the second one or someone who didn't fit because you know there are. 90 artists who didn't fit and that has to do with how a process of selection goes for making a particular exhibition, you know. Of course, yeah. yeah. It uh, seems to me that the idea of finding a photographer that would fit when you're trying to talk about putting together a show of an expansive quality and parameters of work seems like an odd juxtaposition to say, you know, someone who was just didn't fit to something that's supposed to be kind of open and experimental. Well, you know, it's... We did it, draw the line. That's kind of tough, it's one, I think. Not, it's exactly, it's not that they weren't fitting necessarily. You know, we were looking at a very broad group of people that we are interested in th their work and that we are continuing to follow in what they are doing. And by the way, the way that we do research for these exhibitions is so uh, varied. You know, it can go from not knowing about someone and f seeing it on the Instagram and then going and doing serious scholarly research about it to... Uh, doing studio visits in the respective countries where these people are, whether it's Egypt, Angola, various countries in Europe or, um, or the United States, you know. And this is the case. I mean, with all the artists that were included in this exhibition, um, we conducted a, 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 an individual studio visit, had seen the work, whether it was digital or not, you know, we could have just experienced it on a, on a digital format. We did see it in person. Are any of the, the artists out and out new, as in the oh, sense this, this may be one of their yeah. first major 
Yeah. Of course, there are many artists. There are artists who don't have representation in New York, who are never shown in New York, for instance. Some of them who are very emerging in, in the field. You know, Kachanoviskova and Marina Pinsky are two artists who never, you know, they didn't have a representation in New York and now they do. Mm-hmm. Can you describe their pieces? Well, Kacha Noviskova has the, um, she has the cutout photographic pieces, which in fact um, are both included in the uh, Edward Steichen photo galleries and were included until very recently in the Agnes Gant uh, sculpture uh, lobby. Uh, so we sort of broke out of the space of the photo galleries also in different other spaces. That's a big deal for this show too. You guys are utilizing spaces that you've never used before. Is that true? Yes, we are. And the Bauhaus Staircase is another one. That's another artist who's never shown in New York, Katharina Gansler. Um, Her piece involves thousands of pictures that she took in different locations at the Bauhaus, the famous Weimar School uh, in in the South, and very specifically the Bauhaus staircase that was built uh, by Walter Gropius. Um, She shot also at the museum on our own Bauhaus staircase, and also she uh, photographed details of the Bauhaus stairway from two paintings in the Museum of Modern Arts collection, which are Oskar Schlemmer, Bauhaus stairway from 1932, and also Roy Lichtenstein's piece by the same name from 1988. Then sort of deconstructed and reconstructed through all these pictures, uh, a mosaic that brings together all this uh, representation of the uh, Bauhaus staircase. And this is a site-specific installation that was done within our own Bauhaus staircase and that will be dismantled and destroyed at the end of the exhibition. What remains is eventually a photo book that she's making after each ephemeral installation. Is there one piece that has really been the standout in terms of uh, I mean, commentary? depending who you ask, you know, there are... Uh, different critics who are drawn and different publics who are drawn f- to different, uh, you know, works in the exhibition. Uh, I can tell you that Edson Chagas uh, from Angola, whose work uh, appears as a sort of takeaway poster, we ran out within the first week of thousands of posters that th- were on the floor and uh, were taken away. That has to do with the circulation of images and how people take these mementos. I actually um, wanted to ask about that. Are his photos normally displayed uh, no, and walls? No, these particular no? pieces displayed like that, but yeah, they are displayed uh, also on, on the walls. Uh, then, you know, the newsstand, of course, is the reconstruction of an actual a newsstand that was in Brooklyn at the Metropolitan Avenue stop, uh, which we reconstructed exactly as it was uh, with also all the contents, the all the ephemera and the zines, which is totally analog. It's not uh, digital, but again, it has to do with distributive authorship, right, on, on how people communicate and that's a very live you know piece because it is um, there are volunteers there who are uh, making zines exchanging hands with the public and we have once a month also an event exactly as they had it in the subway station and uh, there is another piece which is done by the collective this uh, which uh, was founded in 2010 as a curatorial collective but they are also an artistic collective they're going to curate the next um, berlin biennial and uh, we it was a very interesting collaboration with them because we were in early discussions, both curatorial and with our marketing team. So they created not only two large-scale installations within the galleries, but also pieces that exist online, uh, posters outside in the city, and that took um, the 2014 uh, Eurovision winner um, as the image for the exhibition, which is a very stunning, uh, you know, but it's also an image that went viral 
and the, the virality, you know, this aspect of the title of the show, Ocean of Images, which has to do with uh, um, not only with obviously the internet uh, as a metaphor, but also with the idea of a site of piracy that people appropriate uh, images and manipulate and do something and do something else with them. Uh, the idea of networks and information systems, but also what Jeff Wall once uh, called liquid intelligence of photography. This, this notion that we were talking about before that photography is in fact in constant flux, it's porous, it contaminates, you know, other mediums. And this is the case with this exhibition. Personally speaking, I, I, I could say that that particular piece was the most engaging to me and most disturbing in many, mm -hmm. many ways. I kept coming back to it just to watch mm -hmm. it. We're going to take that topic about the oceans of imagery, the whole concept of ocean, in a moment when we come back with Steve. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. One of the cooler things about growing up in New York City is that I had an opportunity to attend the High School of Art and Design, which is located about five blocks from MoMA. And back then, it wasn't unusual for us to slip out a side door and head off to MoMA to catch shows whenever something interesting came up. Over the years, I've seen many photography shows at MoMA, uh, including John Zarkowski's new documents exhibit in 67. And I saw the first new photography show uh, back in 1985. I, I have little doubt that all of these shows have greatly affected the way I go about taking pictures to this very day. When I saw Ocean of Images last week, I was with Steve Mays, and I couldn't help but notice he was taking some very copious notes along the way. Let's hear what he has to say about the show. Thank you, and what a what a fabulous and interesting uh, description that was. Thank you, Roxana. You gave me a lot to think about there. I mean, first of all, I, have to, I welcome any invitation from the modern to come and help myself to art. Um, so I'll be looking at that. And I have to ask uh, B and H, do you have a camera obscura? We have a twelve hundred millimeter Canon telephoto, oh, and we do have probably... a sixteen by twenty view camera in the used department currently. Okay, just checking. That's close. <laughs> Um, no, I, I mean, I find the, the whole exhibition uh, really stimulating and thought provoking and uh, which I take to be really the primary function of, of a museum. Um, it's not so much a collection as much as, a, as a, an impetus to, to be aware, to think and to look. And I wanted to start with a, you know, just a question about the title. I was interested that this is the first one that had a title and the, the two key words there, ocean of images, Raise questions for me, one of which is ocean obviously implies volume. And currently at the moment, that that discussion of volume is accompanied by a degree of anxiety and images. I thought interesting you weren't talking about photography um, and listening to you talk it explained a lot about how you're talking more about the photographic process rather than the photograph as such. Um, but I was, I was curious why the title and, and what was the logic behind choosing those words? I think that one of the most interesting aspects of this exhibition, the points that it tries to bring together, is that with this 24-7, this incredible uh, accumulation and um, of images that we witness constantly, to, to which we participate. I mean, we, we live in a telematic milieu all the time. We are constantly interacting, communicating, exchanging, downloading an image. Photography no longer really only represents or depicts the word, but rather constructs the word. I only speak now in, in either emojis or photos. Right. There's nothing else yeah. I use. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, the language itself has changed. I'll just the let go with the bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not so well. Okay. Actually, actually, with the bank, you take a picture of your check and you send it. They encourage me. They kind of kick me out the door and say, use your phone now. I, I, I love also that you reference Willem Flusser, um, who I, I, I think mm. is fascinating. And, and of course, he talked about you know the quantum image, yes. this notion of the image existing in contradictory states simultaneously. Mm. Uh, and impossible contradictions. Um, and that, that to me was really my big takeaway from the exhibit. It, it, for me, it was full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. uh, and most, you know, you were talking there about the relationship to the word and the image, and that was the, one of my starting points, was that every image or every um, series of images is accompanied by a fairly extensive wall text. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I left the gallery wondering 
mm -hmm. what the exhibit would have been like without mm -hmm. the words. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what was the purpose of the words? And that, you know, sometimes right. the words were describing and yeah. they were also uh, uh, analyzing. Mm -hmm. um, but that notion of the, the, the picture having to coexist with words mm -hmm. was one of the first questions which came right. up for me. Well, you know, we try to leave it a little descriptive for, for the labels in order not to uh, be the only voice of interpretation to the viewer, to allow the viewer to bring their own views to the work. Um, but maybe it's, it had to do also with the fact that there were so many, in fact, artists that were new, that were not known uh, to the general public and even to the specialized one. It also had to do with the fact that when on the 30th anniversary of new photography, we wanted uh, to make a publication. Um, and we never made even a brochure. We never published anything in conjunction with the new photography series. So we wanted to do a book. And then we, when we talked to our publisher, they thought, well, actually, what you are missing is the entire history of photography. So instead of doing just a book on uh, new photography as a series, we, we kind of engage ourselves with a much more ambitious project, which is a three-volume publication on the history of photography at the Museum of Modern Art. And in order to, in fact, coincide with the opening of the show back in November, we published the third volume. So we are publishing them in reverse, uh, starting with the more recent work. So the, first, uh, the third volume is 1960 to today. And that's because that volume in, in includes, incorporates, features uh, some over 40 artists that were included in the new photography series before. And now we are working on the second volume, which is, will be coming is the 1920s to 60, which is coming back this November, and then we'll go to the 19th century Um for the following year. The prequels. Yes, exactly. So, you know, we, we, uh, this, this need to also provide a little bit more information stemmed from the fact that we wanted this edition to be broader, to be more grounded. Um, the fact that now we don't need to just feature new artists as, but rather to provide more of a point of view, more of a context of how this artist function within the larger history of photography and of art w was a more compelling um, need at this given moment in time. One of the contradictions in, in the show was that um, it, it is fixed. You know, it's, it's on the walls and on the floor um, of, of the modern. And that to me seemed really contradictory with the nature of photography at the moment. Um, I have to say, I was delighted when you said that the uh, that one of your pieces is going to be destroyed at the end of it because part of what we're not because I don't like it, but you know, part, <laughs> part of what you know the real experience of of imagery at the moment is its is its transience. Right. You know, it, we, we live in it as a stream rather than as a pool. Uh, it's constantly flowing, and this notion of of images coming, images going is is really very expressive. And I love that the modern should be doing that as just you know, showing for a second or a few weeks. Uh, you know, a piece of work. But the you know, contradictions to me were that photography is fluid. It, it is quantum. It does exist all the time in, in, in different forms, at different moments, to different people simultaneously. And yet here we are in the museum. You know, it's the conventional white wall box um, with images fixed, um, albeit somewhere in a loose stack that you can take off. But, you know, it's a, it's a fixed installation. And this notion of you know, an installation seems very contradictory with the essence of what you're, what you're even saying, let alone what's actually happening in photography at the moment. Um, you know, it's, it's isolated from daily experience. It's it's fixed in time and space. It will end. It's here. It's in this location at this moment, um, and it's tethered to text. You know, it just it struck me that you know all the ideas you're talking about f were very difficult to express in the in, in the actual exhibit, and I, I wondered, you know, if, if you're you know, how you wrestle with that, because, you know, as you say, there's no particular online session for it. It's just, you know, it does exist as a physical show. It's true that I read online a lot, but I also read books and magazines to, today. And there is something about the objecthood of uh, works that are, uh, that are driven by the photographic 
Uh, and again, I get back to the photographic because it's a difference between the photograph and the photographic. And I think that this exhibition, while it's, it happens in the galleries, it takes on many, many forms. Some of them are projections, some of them morph into three-dimensional installations, some of them are just a map-like. Um, some are takeaways that will disappear. Some of them are ephemeral uh, installations. I, I, I saw that particularly, you know, I was thinking about the Mishka Hanner piece, yes. um, which which manifests in, in yes. the gallery in three forms. Yes, You know, and Mishka exactly. produced a book, yes. um, in, which is essentially um, a, a data visualization piece, right. which is really interesting. Yes. Um, it's a fabulous piece of work. And yet in the gallery, it exists as a book, as a video, and as a text. Correct. And I wondered, you know, it, is there something wrong with the book that? Yeah, no, you can't, but the book you can't the, is not available to touch. Yeah, it's behind I mean, glass. I yeah. think that Mishka did the video e expressly to show how many black pages you'll have. How do you kind of uh, even understand distance? You know, um, but also to defy the rational Cartesian uh, kind of understanding of encyclopedias, which provide knowledge, right? Knowledge gathering. That goes page after page after page that is just black. There is another piece I should mention that, in fact, well, first of all, this started as a marketing campaign, publicity campaign. Uh, they, the, the group started as a lifestyle magazine and then branched out in various other directions. But uh, this exists, uh, contributed not only a piece for the gallery, but numerous other pieces, some that exist online, some that uh, of them are on uh, uh, throughout the city. You know, they are dispersed. You have to find them. You have to know about it. There is no text. Um, so it's up to viewers who encounter them. And then there is David Horvitz's piece, which is quite exceptional because that is... Um, is that mood, mood Disorder? Is this one? Mood Disorder, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Which, uh, which exists online. This is a piece that exists online. We also have a representation in the gallery, we, uh, but, but it continues to exist online. It's viral. It will never disappear. So this is a photograph of the artist that he took himself uh, a picture, uh, a self-portrait of him with his head in his hands. And then that picture, he downloaded it on Wikipedia to the site of mood disorders. Within instance, it became viral. It was picked up by various other sharing uh, sites uh, and accepted as de facto. You know, David Hor Horvitz's piece was one which uh, attracted my attention mm. and there's some, some, in a way, wry amusement because it's essentially what he's, what he's analysing there is, is a phenomenon which has existed for, for decades, actually pre-internet as well, mm -hmm. where um, you know, part of my career I spent working in, in photographic stock, which is where your know, library provides an image for, for commercial use. And you know, the images we would provide in those days on transparency and were then printed would appear in countless representations all around the world with different meanings and yes. different attributions and, and contexts around it. And it struck me it's quite interesting that you know, here we have David Horvitz in 2015, 2016, essentially getting to grips with a, a process which has been around for a very long time of recontextualizing the image. And in a sense, it, that represented a lot of where we're at at the moment, which is a, which is a certain f sort of insecurity. It, you know, we are reviewing what is photography, what is you know, where are we in all of this? What does it mean? Um, and of course, not just in the museum, but, you know, in, in culture at large, we're all struggling to figure out what do we do with all these pictures and what's its significance in my life and all the rest of it. And, and David, I think, sort of got right to the point there because he, he took something which has been around for a long time and made it very specific to one image and just you know, drew out all the contradictions and richness of, of that. Um, it was also, I felt, somewhat forlorn. It was sort of like a... a this is sort of forlorn ego searching for presence on the internet. Um, <laughs> it sort of raised the figure. I noted, I checked Wikipedia last night, mood disorder, the image is not there any longer. I don't uh, know if that means anything. Yeah, it was brought but, down, but it was picked up by many noticed, other yeah. sites. And as you can see it in the exhibition, yeah. uh, by various forums right. and, you know, blogs. And it continues to be, you know, um, this is just a book that he made up to the opening of the show. I thought that one but, spoke to... The working photographer who were also kind of worried but, about our work yeah. getting taken but, from But, you know, us. this mutability of meaning of stock photography, it's something that so many artists now are coming to grips and they are investing in it and they are doing something 
Well, you I, know. I, I, I think it's great because it's actually uh, something we should talk about at a separate time. Maybe it's the next yeah. podcast. But yeah. I, I think stock is, is, a, is a hugely overlooked yeah. and powerful for, for sure. um, cultural force. Yeah. That insecurity, I mean, to me, it was somewhat mer- measured in the title, as, you know, the reference to the quantity in, in the ocean. Uh, there is a certain anxiety in that. Um, I, I felt with a lot of the wall texts were, were very wrapped up in process. Um, it's, you know, and, and, and there seems to be this constant search that we're all on to find relevance and to understand where we, we exist in this now hugely expanded media universe that we exist in. Um, and that, that I thought was you know, one of my key takeaways from the, from the show and to me linked it very much to, you know, from, from the, the rarefied walls of the, of the, of the moment to, to daily life is, is this sort of insecurity about what is it that we're dealing with? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is, it, is my cell phone part of my practice? Right. Is, uh, you know, it's all these questions. Yes. Um, <laughs> is, is, is my sister-in-law a photographer because she, <laughs> she, she makes pictures and stuff? All these kind of questions come up. Does she um, consider herself a photographer? Absolutely not. And I was interested, my yes. friends over at Instagram, um, you know, have told me that they, you know, photographers account for a very, very, very small percentage of yeah. Instagram users. Yeah, um, it's very true. Like I am following a few of them who are quite fantastic on, on Instagram, you know, uh, like uh, Stephen Shore, for instance, or Dianita mm-hmm. Singh uh, or Collier Shore, Wolfgang Tillman. Well, that kind of leads me to a question and I know we have to wrap up soon, but this worrisome nature that we were speaking about images. Do you think a, a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old is is worried about the fact that there's so many images out there right now? No, of course not. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the emergence of Snapchat is um, is really fascinating. You know, this this medium which vanishes, you know, the images vanish in 70 seconds. Um, no, and I, I think that, you know, it's the, the general anxiety about the volume of images, I think, is hugely misplaced. It's... Um, it's just that I feel that we've come into the age of the photographic. Uh, I think we're just arriving there after 180 years or whatever it is that we've been practicing. Um, and, and that it's now just in the medium of communication. You know, as, as you said, you express yourself in images. People, people, people speak in imagery now, which is fantastic. We have a tremendously visually literate culture, not only representational, but people are talking about ideas in pictures. And this to me is just so, so fantastic. And... It goes to prehistory. I mean, you know, how were people communicating in, in caves through through pictograms, well, it right? Kind of, it was kind of interesting, but, you know, difference, apart from electricity, um, was the result of a permanence to that. And you know, to me, the, the analogy is, is really like words. I mean, when I talk about the relationship between words and image, uh, I think there's also a, a, another level of relevance, which is that pictures are now like words. Mm-hmm. There's gazillions of them out there. Nobody counts them. Nobody wonders how many words are published every day. But somebody is counting the pictures uploaded online. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this sort of anxiety about, oh, my God, two billion pictures, we're going to drown. Hmm. <laughs> and um, it's not true. Uh, and we know that, like words, some words are swear words, and you just utter them and throw them away. And <laughs> some words are poetry, and you want to treasure it and protect it and you know where to go to, to find it. So I, I, I don't think that anxiety exists out there. People just people just speak in photography. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, John Harris, uh, my producer and co-pilot. And thank you, Jason Tables, our engineer. Give us your opinions on Twitter at BHPhotoVideo with the hashtag BHPhotoPodcast. And please leave a review on iTunes. We would appreciate it. My name is Alan Weitz. Thank you so much for tuning in today. 